Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us at She Place today for this amazing conversation. We are just going to give folks a couple of minutes to join us um, before we really get started. Um, I'll just sort of let you know where we are right now. Um, well, we, me, and Madison here. <laughs> Come say hi. Hello, everybody. There she is. We are live filming from Park City, Utah, where she places headquarters are at a beautiful co-working space called Kiln in Park City. Um, as you can tell in the background, I'm a bit of a Wonder Woman fan, so don't be surprised if you see a lot of Wonder Woman stuff um, coming up uh, in the background and maybe even a few Wonder Woman toys. Um, but thank you for joining. Again, we'll just give everyone a minute or two uh, to join us before I introduce. Hello. Please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, you can say where you're joining us from. Uh, you could give us uh, your location, even your organization, what you're excited about um, regarding the call today with Farai Chidea, who I can't wait for you to meet, who you're seeing her beautiful face right now. Um, and maybe I will just get started. And if you do like this conversation, know that we will be recording it and you can share it with friends in case they didn't have the opportunity to join us live. So welcome, welcome. Um, so my name is Jackie Zayner, in case you don't know me. Uh, I am the founder of She Place. Um, again, honored to create this community here based in Utah, but it is a national community. Really, uh, anyone can join. Any self-identifying woman and male allies are welcome to join our free online community. When Shay will be posting the link in the chat. We have a really crazy, bold mission, which is to actualize a world where all women plus are valued, resourced, and thriving. And we believe wholeheartedly that our individual prosperity is connected to the prosperity and well-being of all other women plus. And it's kind of a crazy mission, um, but we do this um, through sharing generous resource sharing, through events, through connectivity, and um, just doing whatever we can with our time, treasure, and talent to make a positive impact um, in the world, and in particular here in our home state of Utah. So again, in the chat, please feel free um, to post comments and questions. You see uh, Shay is already initiating the chat, and it'll be a place where you'll find a lot of the links related to our conversation today. And before we begin, we want to take a moment to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples whose unceded lands, which we were calling from. Fry, you wanted to do your own uh, recognition, so please feel free. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that the the Piscataway people, um, you know, this is their land, and I have a connection to, um, you know, the the greater Delmarva area and many of the tribes, um, you know, that that existed in Virginia in particular, because that's where my family's origins are. Um, and and among other tribes, there were Cherokee and members of the Cherokee member uh, married into different members of my family. But this was sort of, you know, uh, the P Piscataway Conway. And I would like to acknowledge that land. And thank you for giving me that opportunity. Of course. Thank you. And of course, we're here in Utah calling in from the ancestral uh, lands of the Ute Tribal Nation and the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation. So needless to say, I'm ridiculously excited to be chatting with Fry Chidea today. Um, I'm going to just do a short bio, Fry, because how could I not? Um, uh, Fry is the co host and creator of Our Body Politic, which is many things. It is a podcast which has reached the top 100 list in Apple News commentary category, a syndicated public radio show. And I love this language, an insight brand about how black women and all women of color hold and use power. And the tagline for the podcast is, I love this too, big surprise, a podcast unapologetically reporting how women of color impact today's major political events. Um, Fry is also the author of six books. Um, her most recent book is titled, Love This, The Episodic Career, How to Thrive at Work in the Age of Disruption. She also works as a philanthropic strategist, and if that is not enough, she's also the CEO of uh, Diaspora Farms, which I think you'll tell us about later as well, and she is truly really a Wonder Woman. 
And I am honored to know this incredible person. And, and Fry, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, Jackie, I'm just absolutely thrilled to be here with you. You know, just very grateful. Oh, well, we are the ones that are grateful. Um, and we're going to have a fun conversation. And again, feel free to post comments and questions in the chat. And I thought a great way to um, start with you, Fry, is your, I mean, your background, I've had the honor, we were introduced, I think, first at an event at Sundance many, many mm -hmm. years ago when you were working at, at the Ford Foundation. But yep. let's start just a little about you, where you live now, kind of, you know, kind of what led you to kind of this conversation today. Obviously, that's a lot of ground to cover with an open-ended question, but feel free to tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, you know, so I'm someone who's worked in media for most of my life, you know, um, most of the 30 odd years that I've been out of college. I've, I've done other things like academia, but mainly worked in journalism and trying to really keep a pulse on the, you know, a finger on the pulse of civil society. And what is it that we expect from government and expect from our neighbors and our families and how do we deal with conflict? You know, for me, I come from a very ideologically diverse family, uh, a family with lots of different ways of serving, you know, uh, civil service, military service, artists, scientists, teachers, all people who contribute in different ways to who we are. And we don't always agree on things, but my family was my first learning lab for how people of different Ideolo ideologies, desires, uh, ways of life, you know, can have mutual respect. And that is something that I worry a lot about now, which is that we seem to have lost that respect that bridges some of these big barriers of who we are. Yeah, well, and I think and it's so a lot of my work tries to tries to surface ways that we can we can engage collectively, you know. Yeah, and of course, we'll talk about that in the context of our body politic. Um, but before we do, um, it, the how we met in, is in the context of the Ford Foundation. And yes. I'm, a, you know, I'm a, I'm a the Darren Walker fan club. You know, I just love him. I think he's just an extraordinary philanthropic leader. And talk a little bit before we jump forward about maybe how you landed at Ford because you were a grant maker in the media mm -hmm. area and I know did some incredibly innovative work and grant making in that capacity. And, you know, I, I would think that probably informed a little bit your transition into doing the work at our body politic. Oh, it, it absolutely did. So, you know, I had worked, I'm a third generation black female American journalist. My grandmother uh, was born into poverty, um, but into a, a family that really valued education. And she wasn't able to afford to go to college, but she did, she later did some study on her, you know, like got an associate degree as an adult, but she raised six kids and among other things while she was raising them, freelance for the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper, which was the black newspaper for the, not just the city of Baltimore, but for the region um, stretching into Pennsylvania and other <clears throat> parts of Maryland. And that's not how I knew her. I just knew her as my grandmother, although I knew that she was a book collector and someone with, you know, very, you know, um, expansive tastes for art and literature. And then my mother worked for a time as a journalist, mainly before I was you know, elementary school age. She had worked in Zambia as an international reporter before I was born. She interned for the Washington Post. And both of them had, you know, a lot to face as Black women in America. And certainly in my career, which was much more linear and traditional, where I was able to get into and go to Harvard. And uh, Harvard was the one that connected me to working at Newsweek magazine, which was my first job. And from there, you know, I worked at a ton of big media companies, ABC, NPR, you know, CNN. But I want to do something, you know, like I got Ford recruited me for the job. And at first I was like, that's not really what I do. Cause I'm like, I like creating things. I don't like managing things and managing budgets. But what I realized was that there was such, and, and you know, you know, this from a, working at a much higher level of finance that 
moving money is a form of co-creation and that you um, are able to create opportunities. So in addition to funding individual organizations, I also helped found the Racial Equity and Journalism Fund, which was, you know, at its start, you know, a handful of donors, including Democracy Fund, Craig Newmark, Google News Initiative, and now is a bigger collective of um, different funders who come together to pool money that is dispersed to local and regional Black, uh, Im Black-led, immigrant-led, Indigenous-led, you know, people of color media organizations. So, so I feel like I, the Ford Foundation gave me a real structural understanding of money that I probably hadn't plugged into before. And now I'm using some of what I learned to run my own company. Yeah. Well, and it's, I love how you made connected some of those dots and it's interesting the role philanthropy has come to play in so many sectors that you would think that maybe mm -hmm. wouldn't need that kind of capital versus other kinds of capital. And, you know, I know you do work as a philanthropic consultant as well. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think when you look at capital, like she money, as you know, is a part of, even that sort of she plays she money or kind of sisters. Um, yeah. But to put a financial lens um, to everything, you know, not in a way that is transactional or capitalistic, but understanding. And I love how you said that. And I don't know if Maddie grabbed it around, you know, financial capital. What was the quote? Oh, moving money is a form of co-creation. I'm going to mm -hmm. grab that. That is yeah, a gorgeous absolutely. quote. And that's something we're really trying to talk a lot about in the context of even she plays and all these conversations is, you know, where, what is the role that money plays in this? Right. And mm -hmm. before we jump over to talk, which we will in just a second to our body politic and well, let's just jump there. So you had this amazing, I know, um, game changing, really, and I don't use that term lightly role at the Ford foundation, arguably one of the most progressive and you know interesting and catalytic major foundations in the country, in the world, maybe and understood sort of the role that money played in, in supporting efforts that were not being supported through, let's just say, for-profit investment capital, though I see capital as the spectrum. And you decided, of all things you do, to start our body politics. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure that seed was in there, you know, and I love how you describe the intergenerations of your family because mm -hmm. me too, like my grandmother, my great-grandmother, my mom, my daughter, I see us as each other's stories and carrying the seeds and the growth of each other's stories within us is, you know, something that really resonates with me. So how is this, where did that seed for our body politic, the necessity of it, of all things you could do, you chose our body politic? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, as someone who grew up, like, my family was very advantaged in some ways, you know, educationally and in having access to books and art and, you know, really the, the beauty and depth of culture, but we were not financially well off. And as I began to think about the, the issues affecting communities, like the one that I lived in in New York, which is a very racially and income mixed neighborhood, Crown Heights, Brooklyn, with everything from white collar professionals who before the pandemic were commuting into Manhattan every day, which was me, um, you know, to people who are essential workers of all types, you know, uh, to people who work construction as day laborers. It's a really heterogeneous neighborhood. And I, and a lot of people got sick and died in the early to the pandemic. And I had thought about the concept beforehand, but especially that, like, I was like, what kind of news can really address the needs of women of color who have been underrepresented as real targets of serious news analysis um, and can give us the place where we need to find information on the pandemic as well as voting rights and, you know, uh, arts and culture. And, and our audience is very mixed. You know, we chose deliberately to go with a public radio show as well as a podcast. So our public radio audience is overwhelmingly white and, you know, 
predominantly baby boomer and our podcast audience is younger and more people of color. And I think that gives us a real reach to understand different types of people. And, and, and so like as a black woman, I have spent my whole life, you know, even as I've worked forever, pretty much in journalism, I've spent my whole life consuming news that is generally normed towards white audiences. And I get a lot from it. Sometimes there's things I critique, but there are things that I get from it all the time. And what I've been gratified to see is that our show, which is kind of normed to speak to and about the issues facing women of color, is also very much embraced by white audiences, you know, because I think all of us need to realize that we need to get on the same page. You know, we need to get on the same page when it comes to understanding this country. We need to get on the same page when it comes to understanding politics. And um, it doesn't mean we have to agree on everything, but we have to at least acknowledge what the key issues are. And then also things like the pandemic and how to protect ourselves. Like we have great public health officials and doctors on all the time. So I'm I'm also, I think, trying to bring an element of service journalism back, like the idea that journalism actually serves you. And it's a product that is not just there to like, you know, destroy your mental health with you having to worry about various things, but it's a product that can be there to support your wellness. And that's why we created this. Yeah, it's so good. And, and to your point, it's, you know, and the, and the podcast world has become, I mean, exploded. Actually, one of my mm-hmm. portfolio companies is, you know, I do angel investing is wait, what, or what wait? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but you know, I mean, they, this is an um, amazing company. They launched Masters of Scale as their first podcast company, I think, gosh, six years ago. Yep. You know, I think, you know, I saw a graph that they produced, like, number of podcasts six years ago, number of podcasts now, and it's like, you know, this. So, fi- you know, finding your space, you know, in the in the C podcast is certainly not easy. But to your point, you know, one of the reasons I think it's it's grown is because people are seeking out sources of information that they're not getting and means, you know, necessarily we're talking about flipping on to CNN or, you know, NBC or Fox or CBS. It's not even news or journalism anymore. I don't know what it is, um, frankly, but I think your, you know, your podcast and, and the format of being, you know, some longer form, but like what's relevant today. I think you've done 72 episodes in such a short period yeah. of time. Yeah. Yeah. And this, like when you pull up the threads of what's, you know, in the past year and a half of reporting, and perhaps you did already a little bit, and we can transition there because I think there's a lot of folks calling in that are in the professional world and really thinking about the nature of work right now and um, also work during the pandemic. We have what's arguably a labor crisis, um, and a lot of research has come up even, you know, in terms of those opting out and reasons for opting out, and that's really what you're amazing book speaks to so let's talk we'll come back to beloved community which i want to talk to you about which was the theme of the newsletter but if we jump forward to talk about the world of work you know kind of pulling from what you the motivation and the frame of writing this book and seeing work as dynamic as Mm self-managed career i mean not work and now the learnings from what's been happening with COVID and the disruptions, you know, I, I just love for you to talk about why you wrote this book and then mm-hmm. sort of connect some of, you know, the five years ago, holy sheep dip, you know, I wrote it knowing that work was getting disruptive and people's careers were episodic to now clear evidence that that is yep. okay. So just invite you to talk about this book a little bit. And I have a couple, I love it so much. There's so many frameworks. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's funny because I, I'm trying to decide whether to do a podcast or something else that updates the intellectual property. Like this was a big research project where I worked with survey monkey um, or what was then survey monkey to, um, do an original data set. And I found some really interesting findings, like people who work for money tend to be more satisfied than people who work for mission. And once I really sat with that, it did make sense because if you work for money and you have a dollar amount that you're supposed to hit, you know, that you're like, this is what work, successful work looks like to me, whether that dollar amount is 
25,000, 100,000, a million or more or less, you know when you've hit it. Whereas like, I'm going to save girls from sexual exploitation or I'm going to reform education, like those mission-driven goals, you will never reach the end of them. And if you're gonna be a good mission-driven worker, <clears throat> you have to begin to make peace with that, that you will never reach the end of that mission. And so it really spoke to me a lot. So I learned things that were really deeply psychological about how we find meaning and satisfaction in work, but also just much just very practical things. Like I got into, do you need to put your whole work history on LinkedIn if you think you'll be a, a potential victim of age discrimination? You know, so I think especially for a lot of women in their 50s and 60s, um, there are questions that emerge about like, will I be judged for who I am or will I be judged for my age? And, you know, so I went through that, uh, you know, a discussion of that in the book. I went through a discussion of different forms of discrimination. But also, I think the thing that is that I brought up in the book that is most relevant to where we are now is what does loyalty to a company mean in a time where jobs and companies are changing dynamically and the circumstances of employment are changing dynamically. So there had been a bit of a stand up standoff where companies were like, well, I'm not going to train you or I'm not going to do this because I don't know if you're going to stay. And employers, employees were like, well, why should I stay? Because you're not training me. You're not giving me X, Y, or Z benefits. And that's all the playing field that has to be worked out and now has to be worked out with things like how long can you work from home? Can you be like my small media company is all remote work and there are like I haven't met the majority of my employees face to face yet. I hope to someday. That'd be nice. But like I hire people who I haven't met and onboard them without meeting them. And we work together without having met. And it's not always easy, but there, I think it's totally possible. And most of the people who I'm talking to as potential talent, they don't wanna relocate for a job. They're like, I'm in Southern California or I'm in Minnesota or I'm in Arizona. And they have reasons for being there that are usually around family or you know, chosen, you know, community. And, and I'm very grateful that what I do can work with it, an all remote team. You know, I do go into a studio in DC to tape the show, but my team is remote for the most part. And these are all things like the, the things I brought up in the episodic career are really about how owners and managers make agreements with staffers around what is their shared work and what is their individual work. So you have to have the ideas like our shared work is accomplishing X. Your part is this, my part is this. But what does it mean to have shared work when it comes to creating a work environment? Like if you're remote all the time, you can't just be like, well, I'll take you out to lunch every other Friday. Well, that's not going to work. So what are those things that are pot sweeteners? What are those things that show respect and engagement and love of your employees? These are all things that we're having to reinvent and I think can be really healthy. Yeah. Well, and it's it's. To your point, like, and we, we've had a few um, events and we engage with folks who run, you know, HR, people driven efforts and like what's necessary versus what's normal, yes. normalized, not even normal, normalized in your culture. You know, like I've, I had my long career, which is a long time ago, Goldman Sachs. We have Goldman, for example, is a huge office here now in Salt Lake. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I realize, and I want to talk about that as well, we'll come to that topic, but the idea of social norms and what's what is what creates culture and what what are the good things about culture not so bad not so good things about the culture yeah. and you know and and what's going back even as we say go back to normal i don't think we most people want to go back to normal nope when it's work i mean there are benefits you know i'm sitting across you know from maddie and i love it like we have a physical space but we don't have to be here 24 seven or seven days a week or five days a week rather 
the idea that people that are running things have just that longer history, A, they have the power to make those decisions, but also they've had a longer history of what they deem as normal, you know, mm -hmm. within the context of how they run things. And I think when I think about the labor disruption that's happening now in terms of unemployment and signs everywhere, it's so many of these factors, not just remote versus in-person work, but valuing people, right, in a very different way and reconstructing the relationship that employers have with their, you know, staff or team members. And it feels like, you know, it feels really messy, but also in some ways really good. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and I agree. I think that, I think also part of it is like, you know, frankly, as women, we were never completely factored into the evolution of the modern workplace. You know, if, if you, uh, I have a friend who's a huge researcher on, you know, and this is not her job. She's a reporter, so she's a researcher in general, but she does a lot of research on prehistory. And she says that the most gender equal era in human history was prehistory. There were female warriors, some of whom have been found in tombs with like, you know, like all sorts of honorific, you know, beads and tapestries and, and horses in some cases, you know, they were buried with their battle horses. And, um, and women seem to be able to span that, um, that breadth of being mothers, caregivers, you know, um, matriarchs, warriors, hunters. And over time, we, you know, as, as human beings proceeded, we began to have more gender stratification. And right now, we are beginning to really grapple with these questions over what does it mean that so many women are um, overrepresented in the caregiving needs. And right now, we need a lot of caregiving, but women are also business leaders and warriors and all sorts of things. And so, so we're really having to, in the modern era, um, reintegrate those, um, what we think of as the sort of traditional feminine, but maybe it's, maybe it's more of, of the modern feminine, not even the traditional, maybe back, going back to the traditions that we actually had, women played all roles and maybe we're reverting to a, an era where women play all roles and men do too. And, you know, we recognize that gender is a spectrum and that we are able to incorporate our knowledge of gender into how we build humane work life systems. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. I mean, I think a lot about that too, and sort of the, again, the, the social norms that especially, um, as a woman, I've adopted and I might be fighting railing against, but I'm also how much am I trying to create that the world in which I want to live in where that is not true. And yeah. there is, and I know I mentioned this to you and I, I think about that a lot about the narrative and that's such a through line and so much of my career and um, my work in film for a little bit and obviously your work in media. And I mentioned to you that <clears throat> I had just, listened to a podcast, um, Krista Tippett's recently podcast with this gentleman named Trabian Shorters. And Mr. Shorters, just yes. to frame, I know, uh, is a consultant and founder of something called Be Me Community. And he introduced me, I'd never heard of this term, concept asset framing. And I'll read the description to you. Um, and we're going to post some resources in the chat because this is like, like so good. Maddie's, you know, and I were like this about it today. So he says, asset framing is a narrative model that defaults by their assets and aspirations bef before noting the challenges and deficits, that this model invests in people for their continued benefit to society. And I was like, heck yes to this. And I heard of asset mapping and abundance versus scarcity mindset, but this is so much more practical and relatable and doable in the kind of connected to these threads that we've already talked about, certainly at work, caregiving, you know, Maddie asked in the chat, um, do we think COVID has shifted caregiving dynamics? And it's also the value of caregiving. Um, but I want to 
pull you in a little bit to, you know, ask you about this and, and maybe, you know, bridge it too to a little bit in this conversation of the work you do in diversity and inclusion consulting and these, these big words that are often thrown around to um, also frame sort of a body of work that's oriented towards truly creating societies that, that do this, right? Lift up the aspirations and the potential of, of all people. <laughs> and yeah. it just that, that term just like, oh, it just hit me and I love so much and was wondering if you could maybe speak to your your thoughts on that term and how that's woven into talking about it were about work, the nature of work, but also this concept more broadly about what it means to be in relationship and community in and outside of work in homes and how those walls are kind of coming down. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm a huge fan of Trabians and I am also someone who is a member of the BB community. They have a, a number of people who join each year and it's, an invitation community and Travian has worked in tech and he's worked in philanthropy and now he's just kind of, you know, building his own incredible community and knowledge center. And, and asset framing is important because it really, it relates very much for me as a black woman um, to how I was taught how to appreciate my role in the world, which is not that like, you know, I'm a black woman, so you need to give me things to make up for things I didn't get before. Although I think it's certainly worth a conversation about what is owed to black women and to other historically marginalized groups. It's like the asset framing around blackness and black womanhood is we have been asked to deal with problems that many other groups of people don't have to deal with. We have to live in a country that only grants us effectively conditional citizenship and con conditional access to capitalism. And we don't get treated the same way that many other people do. And because of that, we have skills and knowledge bases where we have learned hacks to systems that don't support our growth. And instead of thinking of us as the people who don't have as much, maybe ask what we've learned about working with systems that don't value us and how that can be used to um, provide better access to the American dream for not just us, but many other people. And, and I think that what Travian is doing with asset framing is beginning to ask us to look at all of the different groups of people who have had to strive for self-definition and who have learned valuable skills. I think about the veterans community. Uh, many members in my family are veterans and I have a great deal of care for the veterans community. And it is a community that has a mix of <clears throat> you know, special access points to things like home loans, but a lot of implicit discrimination. You know, people put a lot of baggage on veterans in, in different ways. But I think the veterans community it has a huge asset uh, framing context to the world of work today. Like if you are a veteran, you probably have been told that you need to work doing certain things in a place that you may not have expected to be and that you do it and you learn from it. Who do we need more in a society now where we're rebuilding work? You know, people who know how to deploy and do things where they're needed, even if it's not what they expected. And so to begin to shift away from understanding um, who people are purely through a reductionist or deficit framework to an asset framework, I think is, is critically important and can be applied to all of us, frankly. You know, all of us yeah. can be, can be um, people who look at ourselves through, you know, the Trabian shorters and adjacent asset framing and say, what do we have to give? And, and how do we begin to share what we have to give with others and to learn from what other people have to give. You know, it's a, it's a very important lesson. Yeah, I love it so much. And, it, you know, it makes you very, as it should, as we all should, really mindful of language, you know, especially when associated with identity, you know, and mm -hmm. he gives examples of talking about people as low income or at risk or mm -hmm. marginalized, you know, and it's not that it's not to acknowledge that there are, 
issues or challenges, but you just don't lead with that, you know, as well. And it, I do think um, to be more, it's, it's even listening, but even prior to that, to be much more intentional around, you know, and he describes it too, as like the why and the who of service. Um, and, you know, I, I realized, and I don't know if you know this, but back, back in the day when I was at Goldman, 25 years ago, I was very involved with setting up some of our early DNI efforts, including hiring our mm-hmm. first diversity and inclusion officer, Laura Liswood, you know, I think in 1998 or nine, I'm not sure, you know, and I do track the progress of this. And again, I know you do some work in consulting in this field. And I kind yeah. of, I, I honestly, I, I did some for a while and then just got, so I just didn't want to get paid to get airlifted in to give a talk, to try to speak, you know, invite change and then walk away and, you know, not know, you know, if anything happened. And often more, if you just look at the numbers, one would say, especially at these organizations that are most likely to call you in, you know, yeah. outside consultants do diversity work. By definition, there's probably a challenge. And just to be clear, my work back in the day was much more gender focused than a more intersectional lens to inclusion but you know i'm just so to me when i when i read about asset framing and it's also some work um that this amazing leader in uh utah is doing Zeman Zhao around this campaign for belonging and asset mapping you know this idea of of really changing the narrative you know about it's this isn't a problem you know to be solved this is an opportunity you know, to, to actually build thriving work and living communities that actually respect and value what the unique perspectives and like you said, mm-hmm. talent, skills, everything. And it, but it's just, it, when you see it, you're like, yeah, it should be that way, but it's just so not that way. And anyways, yeah. I just, it's just something that really resonates to me. And, and this is the work. So we do have a lot of corporate folks on the call today and, mm-hmm. It's curious about, you know, you can lean away from asset framing, but, you know, is, is when you do work and talks around the world, you know, diversity and inclusion, is that even something you do that much anymore? Or what is your perspective on how those efforts have helped or hurt or somewhere in between? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I, I gave a talk to, uh, you know, Chief, which is one of the women's uh, leadership yeah, I'm organizations. In yeah, yeah. So so I gave I gave a talk to Chief last year about essentially using design thinking and evidence-based research to do DEI. And I was very much inspired by Iris Bonet at the Harvard Kennedy School, you know, who's a behavioral economist and who wrote the book Um What Works, which is really about looking at DEI work that works. And and she's like, it's hard. It's not easy, and yet there is a lot of evidence-based research, and some of it leads us away from things that we might think. Like, there's some strong evidence that actually training everyone to avoid sexual harassment isn't the best way to go. Um, There's the whole school of evidence-based research that says, make it your manager's jobs to deal with their employees, because sometimes you know, kind of the the endless chain of all employee trainings actually seems to trigger some of the people who are bad actors. And if you don't make it clear that it's not just, quote, everyone's job, but it's also specifically a managerial task and that that can be assigned and monitored, you know, so so I would urge people to go and look at some of the evidence-based research. I know that Frank Dobbins, uh, who's written in the Harvard Business Review has done some of that research, um, some of that evidence-based research on how to do diversity training, because it's part of, part of having a design thinking and evidence-based research mindset is being willing to challenge your own orthodoxies or other people's orthodoxies. And so what seems to work in the end is, you know, Uh, being able to have evidence-based research and to experiment with implementing it in your company and being open to um, evolving your processes based on what teams actually want. Like you just can't sort of say, well, now we've decided that we want X to be Y. And it's like, 
first of all, why does X have to be Y? Why do I have to do it? Like people start asking all these questions. Like, it's awesome that you think women should be whatever, but like, I'm already working five jobs. What, what does this have to do with me? And you have to begin to deal with the reality that in general, like forever, most people have had some degree of stress at work. And now in the era of COVID, lockdown, schools open, schools closed, you know, relatives in and out of the hospital, people moving, you have to make a really good evidence-based case for why this is good for the team, the company, and the enterprise. And I'm never afraid of making evidence-based cases for DEI. I think that in journalism, for example, there's, you know, a clear record that when journalism is able to tap into a broad range of people from different backgrounds, we get much better intelligence gathering about the country. You know, like I'm someone who grew up in a black American family, but with African relatives and also with white relatives who married into the family and continue to have a very multiracial group of friends and associates, which is not just incidental. It's not just, oh, that's nice for rights. Like that's what let me go deep into um, various parts of uh, Trump country, you know, while reporting on the 2016 election. Like my family tends to be sort of Glenn Powell, black Republican military people and, you know, sort of civil servant progressives. And we're not super strong on Trump voters in my family. I don't think that there are any of them. And it's not that my family is my whole social set, but when you go out on the field as a reporter and you have to talk to people, you have to begin to create social connections. And I did that through my extended network of people that were um, contextually relevant, had relatives, friends, connections in different parts of the country. And I was never afraid to lean on those networks because I got a much deeper ability to connect to people from different backgrounds and accurately report who they were. If you're someone, for example, grew up in a family that was monocultural and maybe didn't feel as comfortable, monocultural of any type, and didn't feel as comfortable um, forging new connections with people of different races and political ideologies, you have to work harder to do it. And so in some ways, the, you know, the, the research case there would be like, how can your reporting be more accurate and complex if you get outside of the zone of people who are like you? You know, I had I had help in a way from how I was raised and and the ethos I was given to really go out and connect with different people. But if you get a sense that you're in a business of any type, you know, that requires intelligence gathering, you better be sure that your intelligence gathering can reach people of different races, income levels, and ideologies. That's part of your team's job. And if they don't feel that they can do it, then that will hurt your overall performance and your contextual learning. Yeah, well, and your training as a journalist, I mean, it teaches you to, (laughs) by definition, ask questions and listen more than talk. Um, But this, you know, idea of how we engage with one another, especially in what is, you know, I'm finding it takes work to get out of your bubble, you know, mm-hmm. and especially in COVID, literally <laughs> your bubble, yeah, exactly. but, you know, and, you know, these increasing algorithms that feed you, mm-hmm. you know, things that reinforce your own views. I swear, I think we all do their phones are totally listening to us all the time. And what does it really mean to not just, you know, say that you care or that you're working towards this, you know, especially in the, in in philanthropy where, sorry, someone's very loud outside our door for a minute. (laughs) Sorry. Very enthusiastic out there. Um, But, you know, what does it look, look like to step back and really show up in a different way that actually is aligned with the values that you propose to hold, you know, that Mm -hmm. internal accountability. But I, I love what you said, and I, um, I'll bridge because I want to talk about the beloved community, but just on this evidentiary-based work, you know, I think you know I've obsessively collected and aggregated research for many, many, many years, you know, on how, how I frame it as research and reports to support um, gender lens, I think, investing, giving, and action. And I've collected over the years hundreds, like literally hundreds, like 700 
and this we're about to release the latest 50 from last year sort of reports that do provide what you were speaking to sort of evidence around you know strategies that work the realities of numbers that indicate that there are still of course incredible barriers some of the ones you were alluding to access to mm-hmm. capital I, I wrote a study, which is sort of a passion that we're taking on, you know, 0.2% of venture capital dollars go to women of color. You know, it's just, so you can, to not believe, and I think people do, that there are huge still, you know, systemic embedded biases and racism, and especially in the world of money and how money is allocated and distributed. And the necessary sort of continuation to push forth the evidence and the research, and at the same time, you know, I don't know about you, but you, you mm-hmm. seem perhaps more okay with it than I am. I'm just so frustrated too mm-hmm. by the need to produce ongoing, continual research to justify human decency. You know, um, Maddie, my yeah. this is going to run it in a second, so I'm just flagging this. But I want to, um, I want to talk about a little bit this this concept that you were so kind to write our place newsletter and talk about a beloved community um and we're going to transition and if you have questions please feel free to post them in the chat or comments and love to know if this is conversation is resonating to you or if we're not hitting on what's of interest so please feel free to post anything in the chat and we'll try to come to it you know as we transition but I just love that term. And I just invite you for those that might not be familiar with Dr. King's idea of a beloved community, you know, what that is. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like, I, I feel like in some ways the beloved community, it, it used to be one of those phrases that I hated um, because um and what I mean by that is that it seemed so pie in the sky, you know, it's like, you know, that, that, you know, Reverend King spoke about a beloved community that was for everyone, you know, not just for black people, not just for people of color, but for everyone. And, and, you know, really looking at his statements like injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I think that we're living in an era where we can begin to see that, you know, that, that some of the things that we thought might not affect us and us in some cases might mean economically privileged people or people with white collar jobs or white people or whatever group. This is an era where all of the issues are affecting everyone in one way or the other. The pandemic is not keeping itself isolated to one racial group or one income, although there are clear race, income, and gender-based patterns to who gets infected and and who is at risk from what. It's still something that is hitting everyone. And, And if we can't begin to solidify now around the concept of a beloved community where we all have a stake in the game, I don't know what it will take, you know, because really what what I, I gave a, a King Day speech to a college in upstate New York, and I really focused a lot on how concepts like beloved community can be applied to us today and to also thinking about how we all, you know, I, I didn't use asset framing per se in the speech, but I did talk about how some of my friends who are the most um, compelling to me as examples of how to live right now are people who are dealing with material, physical questions of existence, as well as other ones. Like my friend, my friend, Betty Reed Soskin, who's a hundred years old and who, you know, has been recovering from a stroke, but she's still working and she's working because she's a historical uh, lecturer and she loves what she does and she feels that it helps build that beloved community for her to talk about being a young black girl who had to move out of Louisiana after the great Mississippi flood of 1927 and who moved to Northern California and went to school with you know, people from immigrant backgrounds, like she was a migrant within the United States, there were immigrants, and they were all growing up in the Northern California of, you know, kind of the depression era. And she's never had it easy her whole life, you know, but she is someone who persevered and who had a 
a sense of self-determination. And my friend Alice Wong, who runs the Disability Visibility Project, which she is someone who has a degenerative uh, spinal muscular condition, and she's on a ventilator, and she's a podcaster and a book author and a memoirist, and she's just doing her thing. And the beloved community is also a place where, regardless of all the ways in which we are privileged or um, taxed or strained, we can be part of it. You know, to me, if we don't realize today that we have a shared future, when are we going to realize that? You know, no one is able to live in a, I mean, you can have any number of air filters, whatever, but you're still living in a world where the air that you breathe was once breathed by someone else. And, and we are connected in these ways that are so tangible and so deep. And so to, to me, the question of, the question really is, what am I willing to bring to the beloved community? You know, like if the beloved community were a picnic, what am I bringing to that picnic? You know, what skills, what skills as a financier or a businesswoman or uh, someone who can talk or tell stories or just be sitting in presence with other people. That's, that's what we have to do. Yeah. And I, you know, and I didn't think about it this way, but I might borrow with uh, accreditation, you know, the language. Cause I, when I think about she place, you know, Maddie and I sit and I think about through lines in my life and trying to even how we met and we were talking yes. about, you know, the generous, you know, when Amy Richards, a mutual friend brought us together for a yes. lunch in New York, she's like, you all need to know each other. And, you know, just the, the, the acts of creating, um, connections, you know, and community is such a buzzword. Sometimes I'm reluctant to use it because it feels, um, I don't know. It just feels like such a commitment, you know, that I, I it doesn't, not just about me and my intentions, but others and their mm -hmm. intentions, you know, and, and, but I love that frame because, you know, with she place and what, again, what I, we're trying to do. And even with events like this is, you know, do open doors, create invitations to, um, challenge, you know, your thinking and how you're engaging with others and um, lifting up, you know, kind of language and possibility in a way that maybe we're not so much seeing in other places. And if we are seeing it, find ways to share it and connect, you know, your work, mm -hmm. you know, at our body politic and, you know, might not have been as natural for you to find your way into what is predominantly, you know, a Utah audience right now. And here you are. You know, mm -hmm. because um, mm -hmm. whose intention was to make sure that we knew each other and were in each other's orbit of support. Um, so I love that so much. And I want to, and we're just winding down. We've got a few more minutes, um, but it's connected to that. And I'm, I, I love quotes and you are, you know, very quotable, by the way, which <laughs> we're oh, threads. Um, but you had a quote Maddie pulled out, which I loved. Um, we both loved from bell hooks from the book all about love um, in the close of one of your emails that said, rarely, if ever, are any of us healed in isolation. Healing is an act of communion. And I love that because to your point, if not now, when, if not us, who, um, especially in the backdrop of COVID, which, you know, Lord knows we're all sick of talking about and it's sick of it being a context for everything, but it is. And I just, uh, you know, I'm curious why that quote for you at the bottom of your email and as a, you know, the, the, it feels like a great fit with beloved community, this quote yeah. as well. Yeah, thanks for asking that. First of all, I want to say that you are very much part of my beloved community and you have been a supporter to me and to our body politic in so many ways and someone who also just teaches me like I think she plays really does such a wonderful job of, of teaching us about investment opportunities and financial equity. Um, I think that the question of community is that, you know, often my most trying moments are ones where I am locked in my head. You know, like I have gotten some idea of, deficit or woundedness and I'm kind of stuck in a box in my brain and and I'm trapped with that concept. And once I open that up to community, even if there is something that is a real 
challenge. You know, maybe I have faced something that was interpersonal or structural and it's been a challenge. We join in communion, in communion with other people to begin to work things through. Like I just recently went to a friend's 50th birthday party and I ended up standing out, you know, like there were literally nine of us there because COVID, you know, she'd wanted like a hundred people, but there were nine and that was good. We had a good time. And, um, you know, I was standing outside with one of our friends and, you know, he started really having, he's having a crisis of faith, the faith, he and I share a faith of origin. I moved on and I now consider myself interfaith. But uh, the the point is that he's struggling with some aspects of his faith of origin, loving it, but also not liking some of the decisions of the leadership. And we really had a very intimate moment. And, you know, I walked in, giving him a big hug, you know, of support to really, Um, think through what it meant for him to be a man of faith who was also struggling with his faith in the institutions of religion, not in God. And people were like, oh, why are you so serious? I'm like, hey, you know, we're talking about serious stuff. And that's what, you know, I didn't want to just blow it off or laugh it off, you know, and I talked a little bit, you know, not breaking confidences with him, but just, you know, to other people. And I think sometimes we got into a really interesting conversation about what it meant to be interfaith, you know, how I had spent times, for example, uh, with progressive synagogue with that had a prayer center around uh, loss and grief, you know, like I will worship with anyone who worships in love. And I have been privy to many different situations where I'm not the insider, but I'm connected to, the process. And, and I think that, um, you know, when we think about healing and communion, there's lots of ways we can heal in communion. Uh, it can be in families, faith communities, friendship circles, jobs, but we have to reach out and have complicated discussions with each other about how we live, how we love and how we grow. That's what it is. Mm. And you are someone who seeds those conversations. Oh, well, thank you. And, No, it's just I'm trying not to like suck back the tears here because, you know, I've this past couple years has been, you know, as maybe I've shared or overshared. And it's so interesting when you, you know, do share the pain you're in for whatever reason. And it's been a challenging couple of years for me. Family stuff, personal health issue. My dad right the second is, you know, been in a hospital for nine days. And I think like you talked about some of your family suffering with dementia. And I'm always the gal that, you know, is smiley and, you know, and I'm not yeah. saying I was hiding all the shit, sorry, all the sh- Yeah, you know, that was, but I'm, I kind of, I just got cracked wide open, you know, and I'm saying, I'm not hiding that anymore. And, you know, if I need help, I'm going to ask for it. And when people say, how are, are you? I might have days where I say fine and I'm not really fine at all. And there may be days of saying, you know what, I'm not fine. And can I share with you and just, can you just listen for five minutes, you know? And I just, and I love oh, Renee Brown's work on vulnerability. Oh, Amy Redford. I love you, Amy. Um, popped in with a question. Oh, okay. We're going to have to get to it really quickly. Anyway, what I want to say is, you know, vulnerability invites vulnerability. You know, kindness mm-hmm. invites yeah. kindness. Hate invites hate. Violence invites violence. You know, so this idea of healing, beloved community. I mean, I can't think of a better person to have this conversation with. And I, oh, it's last minute, but it's a question. So I'm going to. Let's do it. So Amy Redford, um, dear friend here in Utah, it says, thank you very much for the discussion, navigating this discussion in my children's school and would love to continue to provide the school with resources. Any favorite tools for children or caretakers, educators? Um, uh, so I, it, you know, quickly, for I, I mean, if you can, you can just share them with us and we can post them on the show. Yeah, I'll share some things. Um, there's a book. I just interviewed the author yesterday. I, it's not in front of me. I, I, it's probably in, in my purse or something. But uh, there's an interesting book that just came out like a week or two ago called When the World Turns Upside Down. And it's written uh, for middle readers, you know, ages 8 to 12. And it's about a group of kids in uh, New York who are struggling with the lockdown of COVID and, you know, parents bickering and money problems in families, but also 
dealing with people being sick and 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 uh, and dealing with you know questions over black lives and stuff and it, it's really interesting it's a very realistic book uh but but in written in a really gentle loving spirit about what does it mean to be in community that's just one thing that came to mind because i know a lot of young people are really struggling i have found a lot of uh, joy in looking at uh, my family's history and doing oral histories. I've done some myself and I also hired a young woman who's helping me do oral histories with my family. And I would just say to everyone, that's a chance to document the beloved community. Yeah. Families aren't simple. They aren't always nice. You don't always get along with everyone, but everyone comes from somewhere. And to the extent that you can document that either in your own notes and journals or by doing oral histories with your relatives, um, and it's a great project also as we think about, you know, schools or I would say even workplaces. Like I wouldn't get like in a workplace, I wouldn't get into like everyone sharing their whole family history. But <laughs> maybe it's something where you bring it up as, as an opportunity to, you know, ask people if they'd be interested in reflecting on that journey and, and you know, coming in with a sense of where they came from and what they learned from where they came from. There, there are chances for us to have shared learnings that yeah. are that we really can make use of. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. Um, so much more to talk about Fry. And I know we're going to lose people at the top of the hour as, you know, we are mm-hmm. there. But please... Um, Shay has already posted resources to subscribe to Fry's Our Body Politic podcast. Um, you can financially support this work as well. You know, I'm honored to be a supporter and champion of your work, Fry. So please do that. Write a review. Um, get on the podcast bandwagon. Of course, we welcome your involvement with She Place if you want to be a member. And um, Fry, thank you so much for today. My heart is full. And oh, uh, likewise. I just love every minute being in your presence. So thank you so much for your generosity to be here with us. And thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who thank joined you, us Thank you, Jackie. And thank you for being a supporter of Our Body Politic and of just me as a human being. I support you as a human being as well. As my pleasure. Take care, Fry. We'll talk soon. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.